Hello, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me just fine. I will always check the volume, but um, I just wanted to make sure that if you ever do come across things where there, there's a bunch of time when something is not playing, you can't hear the volume or anything like that, please let me know because if you let me know, I mean, if you're watching it and you can't hear something, maybe other people can't hear it too. As far as the controls are telling me, though, the volume looks fine. So hopefully that is the case. Now we have finished unit two. So chapter six rounded that out. Remember, each unit has three chapters in it. And this unit has two very connected chapters. And then the third one is connected in that it is happening at the same time. But the events of chapter nine are in some ways very, very different from the events that are happening in the two chapters that we're going to talk about first, the chapters of the Renaissance. Now, you'll remember in chapter six and throughout the medieval period that the Holy Roman Catholic Church had a very um, heavy hand and that it had a lot of power and it used that power quite a bit to make, you know, control people, to control sometimes to control whole kingdoms, certainly to to tell people what to do at the low scale all the way up into the royals. So even the kings were subject to that. Uh, they could be dis they could be excommunicated or their entire kingdom could be interdicted. And the church, we don't know that the church ever actually did that to that large a scale. And yet they, the threat was certainly there. And through all of those those threats, you know, both for people who were deemed as heretics. It was, you know, these were people also who were not Orthodox Christian, who were not Holy Roman Catholic. So Greek Orthodox populations were, were subject to this, or even people who the church felt weren't as respectful as they should be to church hierarchy. A lot of the church leadership was also very wealthy and had a lot of outside influence that was, and many of them were not very religious. Some popes had, you know, openly had mistresses or openly built themselves palaces and all sorts of other stuff. So, or amassed a, a tremendous amount of wealth through their position. And that also changed public opinion to a great degree. But the truth is the church was only one factor in all of the many things that created what would eventually transfer into this next era of the Renaissance. And the Renaissance is not anti-church. And especially in the first chapter in this, this first embodiment, in Italy is not anti-Catholic. It is much more of a centering on, essentially it's a, it's a shift in emphasis. So instead of making the church the center of, of European life, the center of one's existence, one's own self becomes the center of one's existence through humanism. But we're gonna talk first, before we get started through all what happened in the Italian Renaissance and the art that came out of it, and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, because they're all in this chapter. We are going to talk about, I want to make sure we spend time talking about the causes of the Renaissance. This could absolutely be in some form in the, on the test for, for Unit 3. So make sure and keep that in mind as we go through. I'm going to cover a lot of them. You don't have to remember them all, but the more you understand how each one contributed, the better you'll be able to, first of all, understand why it happened. And second, make sense of what it was and what came from it. The very biggest cause, the most important cause of everything that led to the Renaissance was actually the bubonic plague. Now, it's it's probably better for me to call it the Black Death than the bubonic plague because the plague itself, that particular virus or strain of viruses, was actually, of course, they didn't know anything about viruses at this time, and we'll talk about that as well, but the, it actually has three different strains, and it can attack people in different ways. The vast majority of the, of the population would get what is called bubonic plague, and the reason it's called that is because people who get it, create, essentially on their bodies, form these kind of black sores called buboes, and they, they're almost like, if you think about, like, how irritating a pimple might be or a wart or something like that only these are gigantic and so they could literally cover the back of your hand or they could turn your entire hand black but they were grotesque they were really scary things 
And the truth is, is at that time, medieval medicine was so backward. They had no idea what to do about it. They didn't understand how it was spread. They didn't understand what caused it, nothing. And so it, it created even more of a problem. But the truth is, it was a horrible thing. We don't know exactly because we didn't have a real census or anything like that at the time, but estimates are that it probably killed at least 30% of the world's population. And because Europe was one of the more populated areas, and certainly its cities had people living very, very close together, and they still do today, but because of that close proximity between homes and people, um, it spread much more. It was mostly a death sentence. Very few people survived the plague. And so whole households would end up with it, and then their neighbors would get it. And in the end of all of this, through all of these wa successive waves of bubonic plague, roughly 50% of Europeans died. Now think about it in terms of today, when we think about COVID, and it's just killed, I mean, just killed, it's killed millions and millions of people of, around the world. And yet it's not nearly as severe a disease, more, much more people, far more people are likely to survive it or even have very mild symptoms. So it's not nearly what the Black Death is. And yet it has caused people to want to work from home. It has caused a, a, definitely a drought of able-bodied people who want to work. And it's made it harder and harder for people, for corporations and businesses to find people to fill their jobs. So you look anywhere today, and you know, from McDonald's all the way to, you know, Fortune 500 companies, and you're gonna find people who are, you know, places, job positions that are essentially empty because there's no one to fill it. Either that no one who wants to, or no one who can, because they don't have people who are trained. Well, this kind of happened with the Black Death as well. So people would get bubonic plague and die. Their families would die, all these other people would die. And suddenly we had a vast empty set of, of slots to fill for people who were employed. And you had all these carpenters die. If they were all working on the same building, they might give it to each other and then everyone's dead. Well, we still have to build the building, but we don't have any trained carpenters. And so what, what happened is essentially for the first time, we had such a, 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 a drought of workers that corporations or businesses, building companies, whatever, banks, anything, um, found they had to hire people, pay them better than they ever had before, and train them themselves. So essentially, instead of having to go through seven years of training as a, as a yeoman or something to become a carpenter, you could go and be hired at a much better salary than anybody had earned before, and you could be trained on the job as a carpenter. So the job prospects were great. So instead of 90% of the population living in abject poverty, these people who had lived on land as serfs for generations found they could go to the big cities where all these people had died and they could take jobs earning a lot of money compared to anything they'd ever would have earned. And they could essentially make up what we call the middle class, which had never until this point existed. So suddenly we have a very large group and growing group of people who are trained on the job, but and become skilled workers who are involved in trade, who end up with enough money that they even have surplus. And so they can live, a, you know, they can work a nice job, but they can live an easier existence than they ever did before. And the, the vast overwhelming, you know, pocket of super poor people became much, much smaller. And, and suddenly we have this, this middle and middle upper class involved in trade and work and in these, these, these different trades that would end up changing the face of really human society. I and mean, we still, of course, the vast majority of us today are middle class. Very few comparatively are below the poverty level and very few, even fewer are above uh, middle class. So we're kind of the, you know, the vast, those of you who are on this, you know, that you're either, you know, if you're, if you're below the poverty level, then you're using, you know, grant money and other assistance because we have those options available to us, or you are middle class and you're working a job and then you're also taking the class, but you are trying to make a living and, you know, pay for your rent and things like that, but you're not abjectly poor. And that was not the case. It, it, you know, remember even a hundred years prior, 
all of us pretty much statistically would have been poor. Okay, if I had 20 people in here, then two of us might not. And that's the most, but the other 18 of us, 18 out of 20 people would have been abjectly poor. And so suddenly, instead of that, we have maybe, you know, six or seven people who are poor, 11 or 12 of us are pretty okay. And we're making it, we're we working hard, but we're actually able to make a living. And then the very tiny portion of us is, is wealthier. But this economic thing could not have happened had all these people not died. No, was it a good thing that people died? No. And they died horribly. This is not how you want to die. In fact, it, I said there were three kinds of plague. Well, they're all, you know, with the same virus, but the bubonic plague was the far most common. One hardly ever happens. It's, and the, the bubonic plague still exists today. In fact, there are somewhere between eight and 20 cases in the United States every year. Most of them happen in the, in the Pacific Southwest and Northwest. I actually, my mother-in-law knows, has a cousin who got bubonic plague from his cat who was actually choking on a on an infected mouse and he ended up getting bitten by the cat and then he got bubonic plague and i even saw the pictures he had his arm his feet and hands were black so he definitely had bubonic plague you could also and it's less likely but you could breathe it into your lungs and that would make it pneumonic plague and so but that was a much worse way to die still is but it's extremely rare um, and honestly, the main reason it's rare now is because of, if you ever watch the end of Ratatouille, there's a, a little short talking about the bubonic plague in rats, and it tells you why. It, essentially, one breed of rat that it was more resistant to bubonic plague overwhelmingly kind of ate out and, and got rid of the other typical kind of rat. And that meant that the, they were the, essentially the ones who stopped the bubonic plague. But at this time, nobody understood how it was passed. They didn't understand disease. And you can, if you've seen the Beauty and the Beast movie, <clears throat> you'll know, you'll probably recognize the little mask thing. The live action Beauty and the Beast shows it, and it is essentially the assumption is that Belle's mother was dying of plague. So her dad took her as a baby and himself away from her, and she probably passed away from the plague. The mother did. But the plague doctors would wear these masks because the assumption was that it must be some funk in the order, odor that there was some smell and that's how the, the germs were being passed. They quickly didn't know what germs were, but that's how the disease was spreading. And so if you wore the mask and put potpourri, you know, kind of like stuffed dried flowers into the nose of it, then that would keep the smell away and you wouldn't get sick. Now, of course, did that work? No, of course it didn't work because at the same time that they were wearing those masks, fleas from the rats that were always underfoot were biting their ankles and giving them bubonic plague. And so um, there was also a religious fervor, you know, quite a few priests got together and they would parade out in the streets and they, they were, they called themselves flagellants because they would self whip. They'd take a whip and they'd be whipping their own back as they would parade around. They get themselves really beaten up and bloody and yet the blood really didn't help at all. It just, you know, most of them would be weak enough that they'd get sick anyway. And so the truth is, is the church didn't have an answer. Medicine, you know, doctors didn't have an answer for how do we stop people from getting sick and dying. And because of that, you know, definitely religious feeling was affected because people felt like the church couldn't help them. Here was the church supposedly con connecting them to God and, and helping them. And the church didn't have answers. And so that affected a lot of people. And there was also a, a, an assumption, well, the, the answers have to be out there somewhere. Why don't we know? these answers. If we're so enlightened, why don't we know how to stop these things from happening? If God's not in charge of it, what, you know, how is he not in charge if he's, you know, all powerful? And so there's a lot of that kind of wrangling around with religion, with science, with medicine, you know, and, and a lot of distrust was building or being added to, I guess. Another thing that was happening, and this was, of course, religious, was essentially what they called the second great schism. The first great schism happened when the Holy Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church split. So the, you know, the Western Roman Empire and the Eastern Roman Empire. But the second great schism was probably a bit more destructive actually. Um, what happened was within the Holy Roman Catholic Church, the 
the papacy, even today, if you are Holy Roman Catholic or just Roman Catholic, your Pope, the Pope of the Catholic Church is in Vatican City. In centralized, it's actually a separate city inside of Rome, even today. And so the center of Holy Roman Catholic power was in Rome. That also meant that a lot of the archbishops who were from Italy had more power and more influence because they were closer to Rome than much of the rest of Europe. And so there was some upset people within the church itself, you know, the church leadership in the north didn't want all of that power to be centered in Italy. And so they actually overwhelmingly voted to move the papal seat, the, the, you know, the, the center of the Pope to Avignon, France. Well, of course, the archbishops in Italy, the Italian ones didn't want to move it. And so they refused to move the papacy. And so literally for, for about oh, 30 years, the, there were two popes. There was a pope in Avignon. They even built a, a massive palace for the pope to live in. So they, they did all their, you know, they, they, they really wanted to move the pope over. Well, the Italians refused. And so Avignon became the center of one pope and the Va Vatican City was the center of the other pope. But not just that, they didn't just have two popes, but each pope said the other pope was, was, was a heretic and that they were not the valid pope. And so all these people who had been raised Catholic for centuries and generations were suddenly, you know, they always saw the Pope's voice as essentially the vo voice of God. And when you have two Popes and each one of them is excommunicating the other and saying the other is a heretic, that's a problem. And so a lot of people either became far less fervent religiously or they rejected the church outright. And this would help spur on what would eventually become the Protestant Reformation. It was like one more bad thing you know, that showed the corruption and the infighting among the church. It's kind of like in the Roman Empire, when they started to falter was when the army started to fight amongst itself. And once you do that, not only does it look bad to everybody outside the church, but it also causes division elsewhere. And that's what happened. The other things that were happening, though, and some of them were because of the, the um, Crusades, is that trade up with China and with the Middle East had actually been rebuilt, reestablished. And so we had technology, we had textiles, beautiful things from China. We also had texts of, you know, that were covering medicine and the arts and philosophy. And we had a lot of the older texts that had been pre-Christian, you know, from, from ancient Greece and Rome that the church for the most part had limited access to. And those were coming back into, through trade, they were coming back from the Middle East from Northern Africa and from places in, in Arabic countries where Islam reigned, but they had been studying a lot of these ancient philosophers. We had not as Europeans. And so the Europeans suddenly have access to Sophocles and Socrates and Demosthenes and all of these different Greek and Roman poets and orators and historians and philosophers. And so suddenly they had access to ideas that were definitely not Christian, mainly because they were pre-Christian. Now they weren't anti-Christian because the Christianity didn't exist when they did, but they definitely were not strictly Christian and st strictly according to Catholic doctrine. So all these, this access to technology, classics, forms of medicine, science, mathematics, that they had, that most Europeans had not had for centuries, Suddenly they have. Along with that comes one of the other big causes, not only of the Renaissance, but of the Protestant Reformation, and that is the printing press. Now, way back in the eighth century, the Chinese people started using a printing press and they started printing on paper, but that would not happen for many, many centuries. And in fact, the first 1455 is the first um, printing of a book in Germany and the Gutenberg press and printing would end up being, you know, rapidly changing the dynamic for a lot of middle-class people because before books were so expensive because they were all handwritten on vellum and parchment that nobody owned a book. You know, a church might own one copy of the Bible and that's it. 
church might not own any copy of the Bible because they're too expensive. But people certainly didn't have access to books. They were just too pricey. Once we have a printing press and we can print on paper and we can print far faster, you can print thousand copies of one book in a single day where, you know, a single book to hand write might have taken three or four months. And so suddenly they're cheaper, they're far more readily available, and they are accessible to middle class people, which means the middle class can learn to read. And suddenly that becomes definitely an impetus for access to the classics, to those, you know, Greek and Roman texts. A lot of people start translating those into the vernacular languages. Remember, the, the Bible still cannot be translated. It is illegal. The churches will crack down on you if you translate, try to translate it into German or English or something besides Latin. But you can translate all the rest of these texts. And people do. And they learn to read. They have access to books. And it's cheaper. And it's far more readily available. And so they people learn to read. And the literacy rate just skyrockets. Now, do they are as many people literate back then as they are today? No. And we still have a literacy problem here today, but compared to then, no, almost everybody can read. So it's, it, but it's still, it's so much better. It's like it's slowly improving, especially for middle and lower classes. With this too, and this is classical, the, the, with the classical text comes what we call classical humanism. And all it means is essentially, it, it starts with the idea that philosophers who predate Christianity still have something important to say and that their ideas not only help us guide our lives and help us guide our moral behavior and help us be better people, you know, even though they're not religious, so, you know, well, Christian, so to say, but they also may give us insight into ourselves that the church doesn't give us. And so wanting to read these classical texts at first wasn't seen as any threat at all to the church. At least most people, a lot of scholars were religious and yet were also studying these classical works. But rapidly, the church realized that what those classical books did is they shifted the emphasis towards the human individual. And so humanism is an anti-religion. It is focusing one's journey on oneself instead of and, and one's perception of reality, um, one's connection to God, one's connection to each other on oneself and one's own actions. It, it involves taking a lot more responsibility um, for what one does, but it also it means that one's ideas are considered to be, they take, they take precedence over what the church requires. The church is no longer the go-between between the individuals here on earth and God way up in the heavens. The church wants to be the, uh, the, the go-between though. They want to essentially say, you can't get to God except through us. And yet humanism essentially says you can have a more direct relationship. Why pay a priest to pray to God? Why not pray to God to your, yourself? Why rely on the priest to tell you what the Latin Bible says? Why not translate it into another language and read it for yourself? Now, that seems unheard of today because so many of us own access to our faiths. And we ha may have many copies of that. You know, I know my grandmother did. I know I've been inside churches where they say, okay, everybody take out your Bible. Well, that was unheard of back then. Absolutely unheard of. No one had access to it. People were still going to church and the church was still being conducted in Latin. And the book was still in Latin and people did not speak Latin. And so they were already going, imagine going to a church where everybody's speaking a foreign language. And so it cannot possibly have the significance for you that it would have if it were in your vernacular, in your common language. And so much of that, this is going to fuel a push for the Bible to be translated. Okay, so that's yet another thing, but it really comes from classical humanism feeds into the Renaissance, but it comes from this, you know, the, the classical texts and access to these. Now, Italy at this time is, and essentially this whole chapter is about the Italian Renaissance. Now, Italy's just one country in, and it wasn't even a full country, it wasn't united, um, but it's one country of, you know, dozens in Europe itself at this time. And yet their, their Renaissance started about 150 years before everybody else's. Why is that exactly? Well, one thing is just that they were closer to access because of trade, 
and because they were sticking way out into the Mediterranean, they were close, they had much closer access to um, the Middle East and to Northern Africa, to both Islamic resources and classical texts and trade. And so that meant that they, a lot of these ideas reached them months or years or, you know, even decades or centuries before they reached people farther north, even as far as England, um, because they were not so centered in trade up there. But it also happened because of what Italy was. Now, you remember, if you go back to Greece, Greece was a group of what little big baby city states, right? They didn't have Greece as a country all united. And the only time the city states got together is when they were going to war against Troy or something else. And because of that, each one, each little area developed slightly differently. And so 14th century, the Italian peninsula is about the same. So we have people in Florence and Florence is its own governance. It is not governed by what Rome says. Rome has its own governance. Venice has its own governance. All these different places are their own little city states. They are, some of them are ruled by kings, others are not. They have an oligarchy or some other type of government. Many are ruled by the merchant class, the people with the money, they, they control the banks and they control business. And that affects how th those particular um, places flourish. So probably the, the, where it started, where the Italian Renaissance started was in Florence, which was absolutely managed by the Medici family a group that started out as tr um, tradesmen and bankers and yet became extremely wealthy. Now they are not upper class. So the upper class parts of society became subject to them because they became so very wealthy. Now there was a lot of wrangling about that because people still believe that those upper class people should have extra access to everything. But the middle class was rising and the Medici absolutely took their power seriously. Were they horrible? No, they're, they're not, you know, they didn't just murder a bunch of people or anything like that. But what they did do is they fostered the arts, they fostered science and learning, and they certainly fostered the trade with, tech, with Chinese technology and, you know, access to mathematics and medicine, and they, they fostered humanism. They often worked in, um, opposition to the church. The church would do something and they would respond to kind of mitigate whatever the church had done. There were times when they, when different members of the Medici were um, exiled. Because remember the church had it, it's, it, it could do one of three X's. It could, it could excommunicate you, it could exile you, or it could execute you. <laughs> and there were definitely Medici who were exiled, sometimes for five years, sometimes for longer. But the truth is, is their influence and their wealth absolutely affected the arts community there, the learning community there, universities that would that had popped up during the medieval period. And so they will be figure a lot. This is actually a, um, a Lorenzo, or I think it was, yeah, Lorenzo Medici. And he actually, he even had a bust made of himself, which was painted and he's wearing the same kind of red you know, a uh, little shawl thing around the, the wrap over his head. Now, they were non-noble and yet they were extremely wealthy. They fostered, you can see, and it's this is actually just Lorenzo himself, just, just he alone mentored um, Leonardo da Vinci, Botticelli, Bonarotti, that's Michelangelo. So we're, we already have Michelangelo, you know, that's one Ninja Turtle and Leonardo's another. We're gonna get to Raphael and, and um, oh, whatever his name is, I'll get to him. But they, in, in some ways, either the Medici or other families like the Medici fostered all of these, this artistic community. And that's one reason why the, the, the arts here really kind of explode. The other thing that happens because we have the printing press, remember, and of course it starts working in Italy before it ever goes north. But in Italy, a lot of writing, we, you know, we already had Dante's Divine Comedy and Dante was exiled by the Catholic Church, was at odds with them. And yet he wrote about hell, purgatory and heaven while he was on exile at the same time, criticizing a lot of the leadership of the church. Well, he wrote in Italian, 
which is the vernacular for those populations in Italy. And, and that had an effect on readers. Readers, you know, who didn't know Latin did know Italian, and so it was, it was easier for them to read, and they enjoyed it more, so it sold more copies. Well, the same started, people said, wow, his book was so successful, let me write my book. And so it wasn't just the Decameron by Boccaccio. Suddenly we have all these other books, including some of the first self-help books ever in existence. And these are like nonfiction life advice type of things, uh, very different kinds. Uh, Machiavelli, you've probably heard of Machiavellian, where someone is conniving and has really no moral compass. Well, that's that comes from Niccolo Machiavelli, who actually had issues with um, the Medici family. <laughs> they were not his friends, and he ended up in prison. But he, that's when he wrote *The Prince*, and his his advice is actually for princes, for people in power. How to how do you, or people who are of a good family who can get in power, and all of the advice is about how to get in power and how to keep it, and that means it may mean that you need to kill people. It may mean that you need to lie to people. In fact, you probably will. And he made it very clear in a couple of the chapters, you know, that it was more important to be feared than loved, because fear would keep people in line and love would not. People would walk over you if they loved you. And so he was he he absolutely didn't feel that any 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 action you took was bad if it kept you in power so anything goes and that of course gave us the idea today you know that that's first of all having no moral compass isn't exactly the way to rule but for him power was everything and there are people most leaders today have read this book i've read it i'm not a leader but i've read it and i reject most of it because I do have a moral compass, but he was really trying to give as good advice as possible for how to make sure you never get out of power. And it means killing your enemies sometimes. It means, or putting them in jail. It means lying to them about the fact that you killed their relatives, you know, that kind of thing. Now, the other person is probably more entertaining, and I really liked his book, The Book of the Courtier. Baldassare Castiglione uh, was writing for, not for princes, but for courtiers, people who were at court trying to impress the princes and trying to get, you know, business done and trying to make good connections with other prestigious people. And his whole idea was how do you make yourself a really good courtier so that people like you? And his solution was A, know as much as you can, and B, don't show anything you don't know. And so you needed to learn to sing. You needed to dress well so you looked good. You needed to play musical instruments. You needed to learn to dance. You needed to understand politics enough to sound knowledgeable. You don't have to actually be knowledgeable or talented or, you know, essentially you're making up all the deficit and making yourself look like you are what you are. So it's the appearance that matters, not the truth. You need to look as if you're a moral person not be a moral person. You need to look talented, look handsome, look graceful, sound intelligent, but you don't need to be actually any of those things. Your job is to just impress people. And his idea of what the, you know, he actually has a whole section, it's about the last third of the book, that's for women. And it includes things like don't sound more intelligent than the men you're talking to because men don't like to be one-upped. I mean, it, it's, it's advice that you would see in self-help stuff on dating today. It makes it very clear that how you dance with people matters and who you dance with matters and that you dress nicely matters because it will help you make alliances. Now, for the women, most of their alliances are going to be made with marriage. And then who they marry matters. That person needs to be a good courtier because it will open doors for the wife. And so there's certainly that going on too. But each, either of these though, no matter what, you, what part of it you read, has nothing to do with religion. And that's probably the biggest crux of this is that these are self-help books that are humanist because they're about your own journey and they don't involve religion. So just as the, the universities had been built in the late medieval period, and those, you could take classes, you could get whole degrees with never taking a religious class. Now you can read books that are, give us a lot of advice about morality, about um, techniques, about success in commerce and other places. And yet 
they offer no spiritual guidance whatsoever, or sometimes the opposite of it in the case of, of, of um, Machiavelli. So that was a whole other world that had opened up that was very much separate from religiousness. The other thing that was happening is people were writing poetry. The first person, and this is Italian, of course, we're going to get to people who, who took these examples and you know wrote them in other languages when we get to the to chapter eight but probably the biggest sonneteer who wrote sonnets you guys if you don't know what a sonnet is it's 14 lines of rhyming iambic pentameter which is the dun the dun the dun the dun the dun so um let me think of a line when i have fears that i may cease to be that's a sonnet from um one of my favorite poems poets keats John Keats, but it's bum 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 bum. That's one line, and then da dun da dun da dun da dun da dun. It's two lines, and they do that for fourteen lines. But it's almost always, at least in Petrarch's case, a love poem, and these love poems are sometimes pretty graphic. Not like graphic the way we are today, but they talk about women's body parts. They talk about women who won't give mercy, you know, where they don't. Um, say yes, but in some ways they create this ideal of this woman that one loves from afar and you can't ever have her, so you just write beautiful poems to her. And it's really a funny trope because in some ways too, you know, if the woman actually says yes, that sort of diminishes her being up on a pedestal, but it also turns into something else. You know, when we get to another poem, um, there's actually a, Sir Philip Sidney in England will write Astrophil and Stella, and that's star lover to the star. That's what Astrophil and Stella mean. And he wrote a bunch of poems to like 150 poems to this one girl, and she ended up marrying him and they lived happily ever after. It's actually one of the few times we saw the sonnet end up, you know, turning into real dates, I guess. But the whole point was the man loving. And that's the focus. So women rarely wrote the sonnets. It was almost always men looking at women and gazing at their loveliness and pining for them. That was the trope. The other kind of poetry is epic poetry. Remember, we had all these epics all the way up to Beowulf, you know, but we really hadn't, we, we, everything had been centered in religiousness since then. Well, Ariosto, Lodovico Ariosto wrote, a, a, it's actually Arthurian, or at least has some Arthurian basis because it's about knights. And so we have a bunch of Italian knights, including this, this knight Orlando, and there are other knights. There's even a female knight, Bradamante, who is cool. She's, she's a tough stuff, actually. And they drew both on, on the Greek fairy tales and myths and things like that, and they drew on Arthurian mythology and put them together so all these knights are going out and doing knightly things. But part of the problem is that they're also pining, just like Francis Petrarch, they're pining away for women they can't have. So Orlando Furioso is actually means Orlando gone mad, like crazy Orlando or something. Orlando is the main knight, and yet he realizes that the woman he has loved for forever doesn't love him back. And at the end of the first book, there are two books. At the end of the first book, he goes insane. And for the next many chapters, he goes insane and, sh and like kills people. He loses his mind completely. And yet that scene is completely normal because men love the way that they love. Now, it's is it silly in a way? Yeah, it's kind of destructive too. But the assumption is that women are much more in control of their hearts than men are. Men really, truly love and men, women are just more practical. I have no idea if that's actually true, but um, that was the assumption back here in the Italian Renaissance. And it's it's very entertaining. I, I loved the book. And part of the book is going to end up being sort of taken from and copied in um, Edwin Spencer's Fairy Queen in England. But that's going to be, you know, like 150 years from now. So all of this kind of epic stuff, though, and certainly the Arthurian myth is going to be translated into Italian, too. And they're going to just have a, a grand old time with all of this medieval chivalry and all of these love stories. And, and it's just that they find it fascinating. The other thing that comes from there, though, is not self-help book. It's not it's not literature and, and entertainment. It's all about science. And much of it is the science of the human body. For a long time, people were not allowed to work on cadavers. They were not allowed to look at cadavers or open up cadavers. You know, medicine was really stunted 
for many centuries. And one of the first people to really bring that out, though, was um, Leonardo da Vinci. He wanted to work. In fact, we know he did it illegally for several years. And then finally, they realized that he cut into so many dead bodies, he might as well be allowed to do it. And so they changed the laws. But um, he, this is actually one of his sketches on this page. He wanted to, to essentially record the human body as it really was with all of its individual muscles and tendons and bones so that the human, human beings looked as natural as possible. And so during this time, and you can see this reflected here, there's certainly an emphasis on trying to make things look as real as possible, as natural as possible. Humans should look like real human beings. Things should be shaded so that they reflect the natural way that light falls on an object. In addition, we should use perspective so that we can, so that what was once a flat scene in medieval, in the medieval paintings becomes a three-dimensional scene um, with a kind of a, a, an invisible wall between us and whatever's being depicted. And so rather than having all these flat people who are just kind of staring back at us, which was typical in medieval period, we had what is called, at first it's single point perspective, eventually they will develop two point perspective. But let me explain, I'll use the Last Supper to do this. This is by Leonardo da Vinci. You've probably seen this before. And um, what he, what, what an artist does, and this is actually, what's cool about this too, is this was painted at one end of a room where the priests who lived there dined. And it was painted so that the people on it were life-size. So it looked as if when you sat down to eat, you were eating with Jesus and the disciples, you know, so it was, it was kind of inventive, but he intended it to have to reflect that realism. And so what he did is he created single point perspective. And what you can do, I can't really do it because it won't let me draw. Um, it, let me see if it will, but I don't think it will. Um, but if you take these lines here on the painting itself, yeah, it won't let me draw. Hopefully it'll let see, you can see the little cursor. Let me see. Let me see if I can select a tool. Do, do, do. Can I? No, it's not going to let, it's just going to let me write. That's all it will let me do. Oh, no, maybe a line. Let's try. So if I take this line up here and I know I, all I can do is add a line straight across. Okay, but if I if I follow, see the line on top of the, the little wall over here? If you follow those lines on the top of those the, those little enclosures in the wall and you follow it all the way down, it, it, it lights right on the top of his head, of, of Jesus's head. And you follow the lines on the other side and the same thing happens. It goes do, 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 down diagonally towards Jesus's head. And so it's right there. And then if you take these, these ones up here, I'm just gonna give you a couple. So if you take these lines at the top of this grate up in the ceiling, let me trash that one and put it a different one. Then if you follow each of those lines down to Jesus's head, they all, it runs along those grates. So essentially what they do is they create this three-dimensional space, only it's on a flat painting. But because everything is a diagonal, it looks like you're looking past Jesus into through the windows even and out into a landscape. So it's it's creating distance. Everything back in the back is is more, you know, is grayer and, and more misty and it's harder to see and it's smaller. So it's but it's this idea of trying to create a real scene. The other thing that's happening here, which is really crucial, is in a normal medieval painting, everyone would be just looking straight at us, at the viewer who's looking at the painting. In this case, though, not a single person is looking at the viewer. Everybody is looking at each other or down at the table like Jesus is. And so they're all interacting with each other. This is the point where he says, someone's going to betray me. And they all go, oh, and they're all you know, reacting, you know, emotionally and, oh, no, Jesus, it couldn't be me and stuff like that. But it's capturing all of the emotion of that scene without us. We don't belong in the scene. If anything, I'm going to take away the little line on here, too. 
we are just watching through honestly an invisible fourth wall. They're unaware of us. And so not only is the room very realistic looking and three dimensional, but they're not involved in us at all. There's no exchange. Instead, we're just watching all of the action happen. So the scenes it's themselves become far more realistic. And that's the tendency that will happen all the way through the Italian Renaissance. Now, if you look over here, here's another example. It's less realistic. And yet you can see here's an angel actually visiting. And it's actually a visiting for Mary and saying, hey, you're going to have a baby. Oh, no. Well, you can see, though, the arches up in the top of that painting that are creating the arched tunnel that's over them in that kind of intimate room. You can see the floors are angled so that and the, the pillars are spaced so that they look like it's smaller in the back than it is up front. That's creating the same single point perspective. But also the figures themselves are not looking at us at all. They're in much more of the medieval style and even the gold. One thing you'll notice, they have the gold halos around their head, which is very much the medieval style. You'll notice, though, that in, in da Vinci's painting, there are no halos at all. No one has it. The only the closest we get is that Jesus's head is framed by the window, which provides that light and gives him a bit more of a glow. That's it. There's no artificially created round globe of gold that surrounds his head. And so it's intentionally making it more realistic. But that's what it's for. Everything is supposed to be, you know, the, the folds of fabric are to, to look more realistic. People's facial expressions are far more vivid. Everybody looks like different people. You know, if you notice, for instance, in this painting, nobody looks exactly the same. They all have distinct hair. Some of them have beards, some of them don't. Some of them are gray. Some of them have, it's amazing how many people in there have blonde hair, especially given that we're in the Middle East, but you know, that's typical. Um, but the truth is, is they're all different. This is again, adding to that naturalism. The other thing that's happening is not just interior spaces like this, but a lot of, of exterior spaces. So we're, we're getting, instead of having a, a, a portrait of someone and there's just the gold black background or a drape or something like that behind the person, instead we have actual windows. For instance, like with Jesus, those windows are behind it framing his face, but they're also a landscape. This was not typical. We did not do a lot of landscapes. In fact, landscapes were almost non-existent throughout the medieval period. However, they were very much a part of the East. So China and Japan, their, far mo their most common types of paintings were landscapes and landscapes kind of surged in popularity at this point too. Plus they added to that perspective, to the, to the space that was being created. Now, another artist who's pretty notable, this is a cute kind of story, is Fra Lippo Lippi. He was actually a monk and he was also, well, he was a friar and he was a painter. And so he, you know, they had to paint people and he would, we know this, one person literally was painted over and over and over again. This woman, her name is, um, Lu I think, it, yeah, her name was Lucretia and she was a nun. That's, you know, of course you don't have access to ready women. So instead you get the nun comes over to visit from the convent and, and he painted her over and over and over again, fell in love with her, ran away with her and married her. And priests and nuns were not supposed to get married. Pro Protestantism will change that, you know, priests, Protestant you know, ministers and things, they, they are expected to get married, but, um, but Catholic priests were not too. In fact, the church captured him. They captured both of them, but they, they tortured, started torturing him because of what, you know, here he'd gone against his own holy orders and he got married and she was pregnant and all this other stuff. And the Medici family actually stepped in and helped him. And he ended up going back to his wife, Lucretia. They lived happily ever after and had a bunch of kids. And um, he was much less good looking than she was, but I guess he was probably a nice guy, hopefully. But they were definitely in love with each other. So it, it became not only did were the, these, so all these paintings that he had made that were being used in all these Catholic churches, you know, word spread about who he was and what he had done and that he'd married this woman. And of course that added to the mystique of the paintings, but it didn't make the Catholic church very happy, so. But more and more, the, a lot of these paintings were still going to be religious in nature because that's where the money was. The church was was paying for a lot of these artists to make very religious art. 
but there were also a lot of other people, including the Medici and other rich families or even middle class families who were very willing to pay for art that was not religious. So these two paintings, these are both by Botticelli. And you've heard of Botticelli's Venus, probably. There's actually, a, I know there's a movie where Uma Thurman plays Venus. I cannot, the, the, word, the, the name of the movie completely escapes me, but that's the one on the right hand side. And that is called The Birth of Venus. Well, these are all mythical characters. These are gods and goddesses from the Greek and Roman mythologies. And I say both because Venus is the Roman name for um, Aphrodite. And so, they, of course, they're Italian, so they're going to use the Latin names for everything. But those are also Greek gods as well. And in, in the painting on the left, we, we have the goddess of spring. And this is actually Le Printemps, which is, it's, it's, you know, the springtime. But it's, it has Cupid in it. He's the one with the, the little um, bow and arrow and stuff. And then it has other naiads and it has people. In fact, over on this side, you have um, the, the wind. What's his name? I can't remember his name, the wind's name. And then he's, he's grabbing a woman and flying off with her. But it's, these are all Greek symbols and, so, well, and Roman. And so these are predating Christianity. Normally, the church would never have allowed these kinds of types of things, you know, and they certainly wouldn't have funded them. But now we have people who are middle and upper middle class or even very wealthy, like the Medici, they can spend as much on a painting as the church does, and they do. And so they foster this kind of art and they foster non-religious art, which really begins to flourish. And along with that, will eventually flourish. And we, we see a little bit of that here, the nude figure. This did not happen for at least the last, oh, I don't know, thousand years. And now we're going back to those Greek, remember the Greek ideals where nudity was great. There was nothing wrong with it. And a lot of the Roman copies of Greek sculptures were very, they kept that nudity. Well, church sensibilities said, no, we can't. I mean, obviously they're not gonna depict, depict you know, the Virgin Mary as, you know, not in clothing, but the Greek mythology, you know, those figures become fair game. And so nudity will come back not only in two dimensional form, but in sculpture as well, as we'll see. Now, Leonardo da Vinci, we already talked about his Last Supper. Probably he's best known for one painting, and that is Mona Lisa. And even though he's Italian, it is hanging in the Louvre in France because Napoleon took it. And, and the French are still pretty proud of the fact that they have his most famous painting. It's not great, but it has, it has you know, strengths. He was probably, if anything, the embodiment of Castiglione's ideal courtier. He was very learned. He studied everything and he wanted to know everything. And he knew a ton of math, anatomy, medicine, science, astronomy, music. He invented stuff. Some of it he didn't build, he just drew. Some of it he built. And he painted and painted and painted and painted. And he was also a teacher. So he taught other people to paint. A lot of people studied under, under Leonardo da Vinci. It's funny because his Mona Lisa, he painted and then he refused to ever give it up. So he, he even when he died, he, he had kept it with him all. He was, he was commissioned to paint this woman and yet he never gave, he never gave the painting to the husband. <laughs> I don't know what that even means, but what's cool about this painting, and it's not, it's, it's actually smaller than you might think, but it's, it's still kind of cool in that it is, it uses a lot of techniques that are very different, like sfumato, where everything is kind of blurred together. So it softens, it's almost like, you know how they use those softening lenses in movies? So, so I guess to cover up people's wrinkles or make things look more romantic or something. Well, he's doing it in his painting. And then he uses even more important, this, this idea of chara, chiaroscuro which is um, essentially layering of different things to create different elements of shadow and light. So his, his shading is very much not stark. There's no, I mean, everything is soft lighting. It's like she has all these kind of muted lights all around her, softening her face. Um, but it's also, he also uses, and it's something that, that um, uh, whatever his name, can't remember the other artists. Many artists will use actually in this era though. He puts a landscape behind the figure instead of, you know, a blank something. 
And so he has both dimension in it, since all of the things, the landmarks back behind her are very much more in misty things and they're much smaller. You can even see a winding road back in the back. But then we have very detailed fingers, very accurate, very realistic portrayal of her, of her face and her hands and even of her clothing. You can even tell on a lot of these paintings, this is what's so fascinating. You can tell if they were wearing velvet or other different textiles because of the way that the things are painted. They're that accurate. They're that realistic looking, which for the time was astonishing. You know, now we have people who, who paint hyper-realistic things. You know, they could almost be a photograph. That's not this, and yet it is so much more realistic and so much more naturalistic than it ever was before. Um, other other artists that were going on were could even be sculptors. Th this is actually the Brunelleschi and Ghiberti kind of need to be talked about together because they kept competing all of their life. Both of them were architects and sculptors, and so they they competed over getting a commission to carve these church doors. Ghiberti won that, um, but Brunelleschi won the contest to design the dome for the Cathedral of Florence, which is actually really fascinating. It's, it's, a, it's a feat of engineering because it had actually two layers inside the dome to support the heavy framing of it. It's, it's it, again, it's one of those things that you think, wow, they actually came up with that. Well, he did. And so the truth is, is, you know, both of their designs and both of their competition, it's funny too, Brunelleschi was actually supposed to lead the, the architecture, but Ghiberti was supposed to join him and work with him. He'd been hired to do that and Ghiberti quit. He didn't want to work with Brunelleschi. So I guess that, you know, artists are, can be cantankerous. I don't know, but um, the, the dome actually wasn't finished until long after Brunelleschi died. But usually that's what happened. They designed something and then it would get built later. It just wouldn't get finished. Sometimes, I mean, buildings, especially really ornate cathedrals could take a hundred years to build. It would take that long from start to finish. So, and then we get to another Ninja Turtle. This is um, Donatello. And he is probably most famous for this. Although the, the, your chapter includes several different um, sculptures by Donatello. But he is famous because he has the first freestanding nude sculpture in over a thousand years. Who is this? This is David. Now we've already had a few, you know, we, we actually have more representations of David, one in this chapter and one in chapter 10 in the Baroque period. Um, but this one is, David is, it looks like he's already done since um, Goliath's head is at the bottom of, underneath one of his feet. But he's a little guy. He's probably, I mean, I would guess he's pretty young. Probably hasn't quite gone, you know, gotten into puberty yet. So he's, I mean, my guess is he's probably like 12. He's a young kid. He has longer hair uh, and, and it's kind of girly features. He's even wearing a hat that has different, you know, stuff on it. And he has a sword in his hand, which is a little odd since the story of David and Goliath involves him using what? You guys remember? He's supposed to throw a rock at the thing, you know, with, he actually has a sling and he slings the rock at, at Goliath's head and thwacks him and Goliath falls down, poof, dead. Well, in this case though, Goliath isn't that much bigger. You can see his head is really not that much larger than, than David's head. And yet it's really obvious that he obviously won, even though David was a little guy. Now we're gonna see another David that I'm sure you have seen. I don't know how many of you have seen Donatello's version but it, it's still very relaxed. He uses the same contrapposto stance that is very typical in Greek sculpture. And he is absolutely and an utter, an utterly nude, in case you guys didn't notice that. Um, other people, let me look at the other David, because I just have to. Where is he? There he is. So this is the other David. And you've probably seen a lot of photos, actually, with him with a little leaf over those unmentionable parts of his body. That was instituted when people became a little offended by the fact that all of his naughty bits were showing, but it's been since removed. That was, I think that happened in the 18th century. People got all offended and then they got unoffended. 
and people still get offended. So hopefully you're not offended, but this is Michelangelo's David, same guy. Well, obviously a very different take on, um, the, on David. He's obviously much older than Botticelli's David. And I mean, not Donatello's David. And yet he is, and he's, he, he seems in the same stance though. You can see the contraposto stance where one leg's kind of sticking out a bit and, and relaxed and the other one's taking all the weight. He also has some other issues though. Remember, remember when we talked about Greek, um, the actual, you know, that there's, there's a very specific ratio and there are very specific proportions that people are supposed to have in Greek sculpture. Well, David, this, this particular sculpture breaks the rules. His head and his hands and his feet are far larger than they are supposed to be. They don't fit proportionately. His hair, his hair is so bushy too that in the front, if if the lighting is only overhead, it casts his entire face into shadow and it makes him look pretty mean and tough. So unlike Donatello's David, let's go back to him. He's not kind of, you know, a weenie hunt junior little dude with with hardly any muscle. This dude is buff. He's got he's got muscle on his I mean, a very muscular chest very muscular stomach, even you can almost make out the different muscles. His arms are extreme and legs are very muscular, but then he has these enlarged feet and hands. Now, some people said that, I know the chapter says that maybe, you know, the, the, the hands and feet and head were bigger because it was intended originally to be on top of a building, you know, the statue. But other statues, that's not how they made them. So I, I don't agree with that. I think that's actually bogus. But since Michelangelo is not here, we can't ask him why. All I know is for a long time, I, I'd see it and I'd go, what, something's wrong with this statue. And that's what's wrong. I, so I must be Greek and I must just like, I don't know, things to be in proportion <laughs> because these, are, especially his hands are gigantic. I mean, his hand, if he, you know, actually uncurled it would be bigger than his face. And my hand is not close. Like if I put the heel of my hand to my, it doesn't, it reaches up to my forehead, but it doesn't even get up to my hairline. And his would, he could literally wrap his hand around his head. It's that oversized. Why? I don't know. What's also cool about the Michelangelo's David is that it was using a piece of marble that people had avoided because there was a flaw inside of it. And he actually used a tuning fork to find the flaw and, and carved around it. And yet this is what comes out. It's just astonishing. I could never do it. Never. I'm just not remotely talented. Then finally, we have the last Ninja Turtle. He was primarily a painter, Raphael. And he created, he was, he was mostly did religious compositions. And he, uh, Madonna was definitely one of the things he focused on. And yet look at how different his paintings are from traditional medieval Madonnas. Remember, the landscape is new. And so he placed both of these two paintings. They're both, they're both Madonna and Jesus. See, Jesus is the little, is the littler kid. And then the bigger kid is, you got, hopefully you guys know, do you know, do you know, do you know? John the Baptist, um, the guy who ended up with his head cut off, you know, but he's the one who, who baptized Jesus during Jesus's life. But they're depicted as babies, isn't that cute? But each of the moms looks very motherly, very, and she's not looking at us. Again, none of the characters are looking at us. They're looking at each other. So it's almost like a family portrait with people, without people knowing that they're getting their portrait done. And the children act very normal and they look like actual babies. Their body parts are baby body parts. You know, they're, they're, they're squishy legs and kind of shorter stature. They're not, you know, in the past, in the medieval period, the, the, the babies, even the cupids would be like little versions of, adult people and that's that is changing so again the naturalism is leading to painting babies and children to look like babies and children which was new but both of these paintings have have i mean they're very different you know the madonna obviously looks different but the even the the backgrounds are you know they're very pastoral they're very pretty they're they're and yet they they encompass, you know, it looks like a real scene. It's trying to really reflect what the sky and the, the you know, the world around them actually looks like. And, and, and even the folds of their garments look much more natural. They fall naturally. They look very realistic. 
her sandal is beaded. It looks really realistic. So that's the, again, that's a, as a shift in emphasis. Um, then we get to his other painting, and this is, this is actually in the Vatican, the School of Athens. It was commissioned by the Vatican, by the Pope and by the church. And yet it is a, it, it's essentially a cataloging of, and I only show you the bottom, the, the top part is this huge arch that kind of, you know, goes up beautifully around all these figures. And you see in the background too, the sky, everything is using single point perspective too. So you see even the tiles on the floors are pointing, they're, 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 they have diagonal lines and they will all meet in the light just above these two people's heads, just between these two people right here. So who are these two people? Plato and Aristotle, who started the School of Athens and continued it and their schooling actually became the basis for a lot of the university um, scholasticism back in the late medieval period and so their the reverence for their you know even enlightenment you know even later on we're, even today we have monastery schools that are based on some of what they do and we have even home school communities that are based that base their studies on the same things that plato and aristotle taught this is actually a conglomeration not only of philosophers but artists and so there are several artists in the background that were famous way back when and there are also several artists in the foreground that are artists at that time so for instance this figure down at the at the front who looks grumpy and it kind of has his he's he's drawing but his one of his elbows is resting on the box at his side that is by most people considered to be Michelangelo, who kind of always kept to himself and was sort of a grumpy butt. Well, okay, so here's Michelangelo. You know where Raphael is because he put himself in here. Let me see if I can. I'm going to scroll up a bit because I, I have to show you. Okay, and then we're going to scroll over to this very far corner. He was not making himself into something huge and big, he, he, but he wanted to put himself in the painting. And so he is over here to see where this arch is and it's just the beginning. There's a person in white with a hat on and then there's right behind him, you see another face and that is Raphael with a black hat on. And so he's just peeking himself into the scene. But he is definitely, I mean, this painting is, is not only does it encapsulate his idea of what, of how art and philosophy and writing and all of the arts are kind of intertwined and how they all stem, at least to a degree, from classical learning. But it's also, you know, in some ways poking fun at a few of his fellow artists. And it's also playing around with linear perspective in a beautiful way. It is actually a pretty large painting and it, it's a fresco on the wall. Um, so it's, it's, and it's, it's, you can find it today. And if you take a tour of the Vatican, you'll be able to see it. Um, now let's talk a little bit. Okay. Michelangelo was actually, you know, of course he painted, but he was better known for sculpting. And even he thought of himself more as a sculptor than a painter. So he, you know, he, he painted um, a beautiful, painting of Moses sitting down. He has like curling beard, you know, locks of his beard and curling hair. It's just magnificent. Somebody said he 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 could carve marble with a paintbrush. That's that's how they was described. And so one of his other famous paintings is, I mean, famous sculptures, and it's one of my favorites, is the Pieta. There are actually a lot of Pietas, but a Pieta is a scene of Mary mourning over her grown up and now crucified son jesus and so this is this is mary holding the the grown up adult body of her dead son it's really beautiful i mean the, and it's sad and it's it's it has the pathos that's definitely you know i i love it it's it's and there are a lot of beautiful versions by other artists as well but this is probably the best known michelangelo who was discovered by lorenzo de medici um, along with others and he was, you know, many of his stuff, many of his things were commissioned by Lorenzo. He also ended up carving and doing the, the tomb for Lorenzo de Medici. And um, it took him a long time, but he, he completed it um, before he died. He, but then finally the church was getting it, you know, they realized his talent and the Pope at the time, 
commissioned him to paint the Sistine Chapel ceiling. He did not want this commission. He tried to turn it down several times over. He even tried to quit several times over because he just did not like it. It, it was a grueling job, okay? And I'll explain why. So this is the Sistine Chapel. Now let's go back to a previous painting and that's the Last Supper. Now this was painted by um, Leonardo da Vinci in what is called the dry technique. So what happened is he would, he said, oh, we're gonna paint it on this wall. So he, he covered the whole wall with plaster and he waited several days for it to dry and then he painted on top of it with, using all different kinds of painting, you know, paints. Some of them were sort of a mixture of oils. They were learning how to use oils at this time. Um, but then he painted on top of, of on top of the the dry plaster. There's only one problem with that is over time the paint chips off, and so this painting does not look nearly the way that it did when he first painted it. It has been degraded a lot. In fact, just recently the the restoration committee went over and quote unquote restored it. And they made such a mess of it that they were, I mean, internationally criticized for it. They used the wrong colors. They, they muted a lot of the colors that had been there. They covered up some things that hadn't been there. They really emphasized the ceiling too much. And so it suddenly sh showed up super, in super stark contrast. It was just bad. But the truth is, is to clean it, they ended up chipping off more paint eventually the whole thing will be unrecognizable because you know over the last 500 years it's amazing how much is it's degraded and it will only degrade more okay so that's using that dry plaster technique but there was a new technique that he should have been using and for some reason did not it wasn't helped to that that room was particularly damp so that you know mold and other problems you know made it even worse this is the sistine chapel ceiling. This is what Michelangelo painted. And this is what it actually looked like way back when. And 500 years later, it looks just like that. Okay. And this is why. What Michelangelo did was a far harder technique, but it's the wet fresco technique, wet plaster. And what he would do is he would take sections of these paintings at a time. These are gigantic, by the way. Each of these figures is somewhere between 12 and 16 feet tall. So they are large. That central figure, you know, with God and Adam right here, right in the center, is, is huge. But he painted it in pieces. And so what he would do is he'd take the stencil and kind of stencil out what, what was he going to paint at that given time. Then he would essentially line it with wet, with wet plaster. But before the plaster dried, literally, he'd let it barely start to set and he'd start painting. And he would, all of the paint would end up getting absorbed into part of the plaster. So when the plaster dried, the paint was dry and everything was affixed permanently. Now, you think, okay, well, that's really weird. Well, it is. And it's funny because in, back in 1990, 1990 or 1980, they decided they were going to restore this. And many people for years, centuries, had criticized Michelangelo for, for using really gray and muted colors and, you know, making painting that was really dull and all this other stuff. What they found out when they restored it were two things. One, his colors were super vivid, but they'd been covered over many centuries of incense use and smoke and other pollutants and that it kind of put a gray sheen on everything once that was cleaned off and they could do this they could actually scrub it because it wasn't going to hurt the paint because the paint was embedded in plaster the other thing they found out is that many of these figures you see there's how many nudes there are and he was well known for painting and sculpting lots and lots of nudes which got him a lot of criticism, including in here. Well, back at, we don't know exactly when, back in the 1700s or 1800s, people got, or maybe even earlier, they got a little irritated with the fact that there are all these nude people. So they started painting, people actually were commissioned, and the, uh, over the figures that were nude, they painted little loincloths and stuff to cover up all the naughty bits, okay? Once this was restored, all of those naughty bits were cover, uncovered. And some of the figures that we had traditionally thought were men were women or vice versa. And so it threw into 
you know, kind of messed with a lot of scholarship about these paintings too, because we we didn't get all the details right. We didn't, they weren't, first of all, they were printed very vividly. You can see this, just bright golds and bright reds and bright blues and greens, not at all what we would have expected. And yet they are still, you know, in, in so many ways, this is exactly what Michelangelo painted 500 years prior because of the way he painted it. And this will be preserved for hundreds of years to go because of the way it was painted. So darn it, it's really sad that Da Vinci didn't do that because it would have been awesome. I just, you know, it, it's so sad because, and we have paintings that were painted at the time of the Last Supper that are vivid and beautiful. And so we know, we have a really good idea of what colors he used because of what those paintings looked like. And yet those colors are all gone. And what they, what's what been left behind is really sad compared to what it was. And it's because it was painted on dry plaster. So I'm still really sad about it in case you guys are wondering. I mourn every time I teach this particular chapter. Okay, so we're almost done. All we have left is, we have a few more slides, but most of this is gonna cover Renaissance architecture and the Italian Renaissance and, and really the Northern Renaissance too. But um, what they did is they took a lot of the classical ideas, you know, the dome, um, even the triangular, you know, roofs and, and a lot of those other things, but they made them into symmetri symmetrical um, objects and buildings. So they loved symmetry above all. So if there's a window on one side, there needs to be a window on the other side. Even more so, they loved squares and circles because they had quote unquote perfect symmetry. So domes, of course, would be in that perfect circle. Arches can be in front, but if they're on one side, then they need to be on the other side. In fact, there are buildings that are, I think I, do I have one? Yes, this building, the Villa Rotunda is actually in, it's a, it, it was a family home. It's huge in case you're wondering. So this was the, one of those old McMansions. But what's cool about it is that this front piece that you see, here's the, you can see the Greek style. Here's the steps coming down, but you see those six pillars. They are in, do you know what style that is? They are in Ionic style. And yet if you go above it, you see those three those three figures, the statues on top. That's very much an installment of um, the Renaissance. But then if you look on the sides, you see those little statues on the sides up on the rooftop? That's because over on those sides, there are corresponding staircases. So this building is actually built in a perfect square. In the center, which you cannot see from this photograph, behind that triangular rooftop is a dome. And, and it, it's a dome that actually carries um, light all the way down to the bottom story. So it's open all the way through in that central area in, in a circle. And yet on each side of all four of these outer walls is a staircase and entryway just like this one. So it's hard to even know, okay, where's the front? Because they all look exactly the same. And all of them had five statues, three up on the rooftop and two over on those, those two sides of the staircase on all four sides. So no matter which way you walked in or walked out, it was all symmetrical. In fact, even the room, like the room sizes were all symmetrical inside. The next floor, everything was all symmetrical. It was just symmetry upon symmetry upon symmetry. So that that square and circle idea was absolutely part of what it was. So you can see even this middle building, you can see the dome from several angles, but the middle building itself is actually a square. So you walk into the square and it's a square building with a dome in the center of it. And you'll notice even the decoration on the, on the, on the sides, these are, these are squares up at these arches with little circles in, in, in the middle. Even the artist, artistry, all those medallions, those are all circular. So we've got circles, even the windows are circles. They've got the, the skylight in the top is a circle. It's just, you know, again, it's those two shapes over and over and over again, square, circle, square, circle, square. Because again, we have the symmetry. So that's all about it. So yes, they did draw from classical ideas but then they made them into their own very unique style. The other thing that happened is that they learned, okay, we can use concrete and we can pretend to use, you know, we can essentially create the style from the ancient world without all the extra stuff. So a lot of the buildings that were built during the Renaissance, and you can see this very strongly in Florence, especially, but other parts of Italy as well, 
they would have what looked like arches and yet like these arches above the windows are just concrete. They're, they're poured concrete to look like it's brickwork and to look like these are built arches out of stone, but they're not stone. It's kind of like, you know, you, people will make the, 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 you know, the driveway up to their garage. They'll make it look like it's laid stone by just using little kind of, you know, they'll press these kind of molds into the wet concrete. Well, that's exactly what they did. They would pour concrete, but they'd style the concrete, the wall to create the framing so that it looked like it was stonework. So they had the style of the classical stuff. They, in fact, these even use the, the Corinthian column styling up at the top of those columns, but those aren't real columns. They're just little flat pretend pillars. And, and so they, they wanted the style, but they wanted the, they wanted it to be easier to be built and cheaper. And so it's, it, it has an old feel to it, but it's not authentic. And that's intentional. It's all intentional. This was absolutely authentic though. They didn't play around with the pillars here. They really, this, whoever, and I don't know the history behind this. I don't know who originally built it, what family, but they had money, definitely had money. They, because it's, it's a massive building. The other thing they did too, and this is a theater. Remember the theaters we used to have. So back in the Greeks and Romans, they had outdoor theaters. This is the first time they've had an indoor theater. And yet they use a lot of natural lighting. You can see it from behind. You see the, the windows are open above the statues that are lining the very top. And yet the theatrical area, the staging area, you'll notice has a bunch of doorways. Remember the doorways in, in Roman staging? And yet that central arched doorway, if you look inside the doorway, and you can actually look up Teatro Olimpico and you're gonna see it, but that's, Inside, there are other faux buildings that make it look as if there's the street goes all the way back to the background. And the ceiling, both in the backstage area and in the ceiling above the audience were, were made into a cloudy sky as if we're outside, as if we're watching this theater, you know, this from, uh, you know, as if this is a Roman theater and we're just watching and we're looking at real real styling at the same time though of course they're playing with perspective because the the street that seems to go off into way far in the distance is actually not as far as it looks but they make the buildings smaller faster so that it looks farther away they're playing with it just the way that they did with disney you know when i talked about perspective and making all the windows smaller and the towers smaller as they go up the castle so it looks farther away they're doing exactly the same thing so they're playing with perspective and yet you can still see the columns are being used, but this place is filled with statues, even on the stage itself. There are smaller statues in the background as part of the structure of the staging. Really cool place. I would love to see a play here. That would be awesome, but I have not. Um, and then we, they started, and the reason I say we started, remember I said that building sometime took a hundred years. Well, um, part of the St. Peter's Basilica was, was designed by Bramante. Part of it was designed by, in fact, the dome of it was designed by Michelangelo. It is actually too heavy and they have to, Michelangelo was a little heav heavy in his design. So they have to actually work on it to, to keep it from fall, breaking down what's below it. Um, but both of these two people who designed the Basilica died long before it was ever completed. It was not really completed until the Baroque era. And that's one reason you see all these little statues up at the top. Those are actually statues, all part of the design by another sculptor from the Baroque period. And we're gonna get to him later and I'll describe more of the Basilica and the area around it, St. Peter's Square, for instance, because he designed those elements. And we're gonna talk about, he essentially was taking the Renaissance ideas and then adding to them and making them a bit more florid to make it into a Baroque style. So if you're interested in architecture and you're thinking about your paper, this is certainly something you could be comparing Greek to Renaissance or Greek to Baroque or Greek and Roman to um, neoclassical because that will come after the Baroque period. So, but um, we'll see if you have questions though about these particular things or you need more information, just let me know. I actually have a lot of books on um, architecture of different, very, of varied periods, not all of the periods, but a lot of them.
Renaissance music, remember we, we got from the point, and I, I even played that stuff for you, where you had, you know, you went from monophony to polyphony. Well, Renaissance music became even more complex, especially courtly music, but even, even religious music became more complex. But courtly music, you know, of course, was centered around dance and dance was one of the ways that people made assignations and that they made, they worked out deals and decided on who they were gonna marry and you know, different things like that. And so the courtly realm was definitely one where music was necessary. And this was actually a time when we became much more likely to sing differently, like have a, a specific tune playing and sing a different alternating tune. This was much more of a time when you could have several different musical instruments, all of them playing somewhat differently so that they together sounded good and yet they weren't nearly as much in unison as they used to be. There are, this is also a time when they play around with tempo. They play around with all sorts of things. The, the rules no longer apply and you can play around with things and see what works best. Now, sacred music still at this point was largely a cappella. So either you had instrumental music, you know, from an organ or from other instruments within, you know, inside the church, or you had people singing, but you didn't have both. Courtly music was almost always both instrumental and vocal, or at least instrumental, and then you could easily add a voice to things. A lot of people would take the poetry, for instance, like of Petrarch and other people, and make it into songs. And so they would sing Petrarchan songs. That just became pretty standard. Um, if you go to the the actual um, PowerPoint for this, though, you can actually look up, or you could even just look it up on YouTube too. You could look up Nymphes de Bois and Toto Pulcra by um, Dupre and, and Isaac. The last thing we're going to talk about, and we have just a couple minutes, um, the Renaissance in Venice was a little bit different, mainly because Venice had ties, much more ties to um, Judaism and Islam and other non-Christian ways of thinking. They, I mean, they were definitely cosmopolitan, but they were not nearly as moralistic as many other places. Rome, of course, was going to be, because the Vatican was still in its center, was going to be highly Roman Catholic. Venice, not so much. There's actually, and there's a large, um, a large part of the population that's much more into trade and courtliness and even having a party than, anything religious at all. Um, what we do know though, and, and, and you can see just from its exterior, this is actually the St. Mark's Basilica in Venice. And part of Venice, we always have this image of Venice being, you know, just water with extra water, but that's actually not true. Parts of Venice are very much within, you know, built into water. Um, some of it is, the, the tide is rising as well, but, um, but a lot of those are, have canal ways with you know the gondolas that are so famous but then part of venice is above water and so this is actually a portion that is not typically underwater though sometimes there can be flooding depending on what's going on but um but you can see with the styling you can probably see the the influence of islamic architecture because the the there are several domes and several arches but they are pointed in a way that is very much a middle eastern tendency. So this actually speaks all the way to India in its in its styling. And a lot of the florid elements and the little statuary, a lot of those stylings actually come from um, Islamic influence as opposed to Roman Catholic. Even the the you can see just at the bottom the colonnades, which are really a basis of several, you know, two tiers, but several different pillars all put together that is very different and it's 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 definitely unique styling that comes more from islamic architecture but there it's a beautiful building it's just very unique compared to it's not typical for the rest of renaissance italy and that's one reason why um, we have to discuss them a little bit separately but they they were somewhat separate the other thing that they had is a, a he's not one of the ninja turtles because all four of those guys came from florence italy but um titian and we know of people talk of Titian, like a Titian blonde or someone, and it's usually a redheaded sort of, you know, they have a reddish blonde hair. Um, and that's typical for Titian. He painted a lot, not only of nudes, but a lot of classical um, 
you know, things that draw from Greek and Roman sources, you know, gods and goddesses and, and, and figures within Greek and Roman literature. But he also, you know, actually spent a lot of time painting, painting paintings with kind of a moral purpose to them. So, you know, and, and sometimes the moral isn't what you think, you know, in this case, for instance, that he has two figures and one of them, the one that's nude is actually the better, the more moral figure than the one that's all dressed up because one cares, you know, is, is true and the other one is putting on fakery. So, you know, you never quite know how to interpret all of these, but he absolutely um, painted, he, and he pa painted, not only did he paint a lot of women in the nude, but he painted a lot of um, pretty significant paintings. It's funny too, because the Duke of Ferrara, who was one of, he actually ruled one of the city-states that the Ferrara did, although there were many Dukes of Ferrara. There's a, a poem called My Last Duchess, if you've ever taken Comp 2 and they, or a literature class and they read it, and it's, it's by a later poet, Robert Browning, but the Duke talks about how he was jealous of his wife and had her killed. Well, the, several Dukes of Ferrara were well known for being suspected of poisoning their wives and other stuff like that. But this Duke of Ferrara wanted to paint for, wanted four paintings painted. And he commissioned four different artists to paint them. Okay, including Raphael as one. I think Donatello was one. And then Michelangelo and Titian. Titian ended up painting all of them because Michael Michelangelo just refused to do it because <laughs> it's Michelangelo and the other two died. And so Titian ended up doing, completing all four paintings within the commission and making a name for himself. He was younger than the others. And, um, but, but Raphael actually died pretty young. I can't remember what, what he died of, but I think the chapter does say, I just don't remember it off the top of my head. And I don't want to say something wrong. So that's kind of where we are in Italy. This is the end of, of the Italian Renaissance. But what we're going to find, and you will see as you go to chapter eight, and I'll talk about this in that particular discussion, is that the Italian Renaissance, though earlier, will end up inspiring several elements within the Northern Renaissance. But the Northern Renaissance is going to be imbued with one big factor, and it's going to affect everything. And that is the po Protestant Reformation. Protestantism and the rejection of the Catholic Church will have a profound effect on literature, culture, music, art, architecture, everything. Everything you can't, you won't be able to study the Northern Renaissance without understanding Protestant reform, reform because they they are hand in hand together. There there is no Renaissance without Reformation up up, up north. Okay, so but we will get to that in chapter eight. Thanks for watching. See ya.